a moment it'll start recording there you go perfect thank you just want to make sure uh, welcome everyone to managing lives with biologicals my name is brenda palencia and i am a marketing intern at maroon bio innovations before we get started i just want to remind you all a bit about ceu credits for California, Washington, Oregon, and Arizona, we do provide credits, but you must take a quiz at the end of the webinar. I will provide a QR code that you can scan as well as a link in the chat that you could take at the end of the webinar. You will receive your certificate within one week from today's webinar. For Washington and Oregon, I would like to remind you all, you must participate in the comments section halfway through the webinar by adding in the chat your name, your license number, and accredited state, as well as take the quiz. We will remind you all, but we just like to bring it up at the beginning. Before we get started, I would just like to remind you all that Morel Bio Innovations is a publicly traded company, so we are required to remind you all that any information discussed in this presentation should not be solely used to determine your interest and or level of investment in its stock. We encourage you to conduct your own due diligence when making financial investment decisions about Morel Bio Innovations. Now to introduce some of our speakers today. We have Dr. Melissa O'Neill. Melissa has served in her current role in Morel Bio Innovations as a Senior Product Development Manager for the Southwestern United States since June of 2014. Prior to that time, she worked as a PCA and CCA with Booth Ranches and was formerly an employee of Dr. Beth Grafton Cardwell's Citrus Entomology Laboratory, jointly stationed at Linco Kearney Agricultural Research and Extension Centers. Melissa holds AA and AS degrees from College of the Sequoias, a BS in Biology from Fresno State, a MS in Agriculture from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, and a Doctorate of Education from California State University, Fresno. Melissa's current research interests include entomology, plant pathology, plant health, and weed science. She is also involved with investigations centered on issues affecting women in science, technology, mathematics, and engineering disciplines, and the importance of STEM education to overall student success. Today, we also have Doug, Doug McDowell. Doug is Marone Bio's Territory Sales Manager for the Southern Central Valley of California, which includes the South San Joaquin Valley. Doug has 25 years of experience managing sales and technical services in the fresh brew and vegetable preservation industry with a focus on chemical and biological solutions in citrus, stone fruit, and pomegranates. For the past two years, Doug has advised growers and agriculture distributors on the use of jet ag and jet oxide 15% to manage disease, pest, and food safety concerns. Doug is a licensed PCA and has a master's degree in biology from California State University, Fresno. We have a special guest today, Dr. Sandeepa Gautam. Uh, Dr. Sandeepa Gautam is a Cooperative Extension Area Citrus IPM Advisor at the UC Lind Cove Research and Extension Center, serving for Fresno, Madera, Tulare, and Kern Counties. Gautam's research and extension focuses on integrated management of insects and mice that are important to California citrus production. Prior to joining UCCE, Gautam was an Assistant Research Entomologist with Department of Entomology, UCR. Her research program focused on managing citrus pests that have an export significance. Gautam's graduate and postdoc studies focused on investigating ecology and biology of insect pest species, comparing egg morphologies to explore possible mechanisms of tolerance to fumigants, evaluating efficacies of fumigants to be used as post-harvest fumigant and resistant management. Gautam has also received several awards, including Graduate Research Excellence Award by Oklahoma State University for her master's and PhD research, and a national award from the President of Nepal for her outstanding performance in BS Agriculture in 2007. So thank you all to our presenters today, and I will go ahead and hand it over to Doug. 
All right, thank you everyone for joining us on this uh, webinar this morning. Um, right now, I'm just going to briefly go through some company um, uh, general information, uh, overview, background, and a little bit of history. And then uh, we're going to explore the uh, the properties and performance of our two insecticides, Grandivo, WDG, as well as Venerate XC. Uh, next slide. So Marone Bio was founded in 2006 by Pam Marone uh, and went public in 2013. And our current headquarters actually has just moved from Davis, California to Raleigh, North Carolina. And our man manufacturing plant is in Bangor, Michigan. Uh, we do have uh, nationwide sales staff as well as, well as uh, technical support and global distribution with over 450 patents. And we do have a library of over 18,000 microorganisms that we continuously screen for uh, fung fungicidal, insecticidal, and nematicide uh, properties. Next slide. Oh, and our CEO, current CEO is Kevin Helash. All right. Uh, this is a, a graph of our current product portfolio, although uh, today we're going to focus on the um, the two insecticides down at the bottom uh, left hand corner of uh, Grandivo and Venerate. But we do have a robust uh, portfolio of bactericides and fungicides, as well as uh, plant health products and seed treatments. Next slide. And next slide. Um, with the exception of our uh, heat stress management product called Haven, which is not uh, approved for organic, all our other products are uh, OMRI listed and approved for organic production. They're all uh, exempt from residue tolerance, uh, minimal PPE, and generally carry a zero day PHI four hour uh, reentry interval. And again, uh, uh, approved for both organic and conventional production. Uh, our sales staff um, is uh, for North America, uh, covers most of the ag producing regions of the United States. Um, and uh, also next slide, we have uh, product development and technical support, uh, both on the West Coast and in the Midwest and on the East Coast as well. Next slide. So, the first insecticide I'm just going to go over is Grandivo WDG, and then I'll discuss uh, Venerate after. Uh, Grandivo is a uh, water dispersible granule. It contains heat killed chromobacterium and spent fermentation media. It's labeled for one to three pounds per acre and at an interval of four to 10 days uh, applications, uh, depending on pest pressure. Uh, and it's mainly targeting the newly hatched caterpillar larvae and nymphs and adults for the suckers uh, and uh, disrupt reproduction of both insects and mites. And in the chat, I had asked uh, everyone in the um, audience who works with strawberries, stone fruit, and blueberries. And the reason why I did that is Grandivo is an awesome product to be used for spotted wing drosophila. And um, and so I just wanted to make that. I, although this is a mites talk, but just, it, this is the this is the time of year where we're going to start seeing SWD start populations start to uh, rise depending on your uh, crop of choice. Uh, next slide. So as far as modes of action, Grandivo as well as Venerate, they're both stomach poisons. Uh, so Grandivo also. Uh, is an uh, agitation or repellent uh, if it doesn't outright kill the insect. Um, gut disruption occurs uh, in uh, and death in about four to six days, so it's a slow kill, but uh, feeding stops within seconds. And there is uh, an activity on the egg laying um, viability, hatching and fecundity uh, reduction. Uh, next slide. 
some uh, general uh, features of the product. We had already mentioned MRL exempt and the um, reentries. Uh, it has excellent shelf life. Uh, again, minimal PPE, very tank mix compatible and easy to mix and apply as well. Next slide. Um, so as far as use with beneficials, uh, I would like to say that Grandivo as well as Venerate are excellent products to use. Uh, there's very little, no uh, negative effect on the most common uh, beneficials that uh, we use in egg production. Next slide. Um, OK, there we go. So this is an example of a test that was conducted by Vineland Research Institute where they uh, um, exposed uh, over 96 hours at three times the maximum label rate to the four uh, beneficial mite species that you see on the on the right hand side. And there was no negative effect on from both Grandivo or Venerate. Next slide. OK, some other uh, advantages for using Grandivo. Uh, there are no minimum or max per season. You can apply as many times as you need to. You do not have to post. Uh, uh, and again, no MRLs, so uh, no effect on pollination or fruit set. There's no phytotoxicity issues, and you can use them in nurseries or out in the fields. Next slide. Uh, in general, a lot of people will ask us, uh, well, when do you choose to use Grandivo or Venerate? You never want to mix them together, so you always want to apply them in rotation, uh, but there are certain key times of the season or during key times of pest pressure where you want, may want to select one or the other. So in general, if you're looking for controlling mites, thrips, aphids, white flies, uh, and mealybugs, you, you want to look at starting your applications early. And that would, I would say that's true for all of our biologicals. Uh, they work much better as a preventative than when you have a major problem on your hands. Um, if the populations are predominantly all adults, then start your uh, applications with Grandivo. If they're mixed populations or if they're uh, young, then uh, Venerate seems to be um, the, the product of choice as far as having a better effect uh, on kill. Um, also, um, it's recommended to use a sticker spreader, but uh, avoid the organosilicones and also the acid-based surfactants or adjuvants such as Li700. Uh, we found that the acid-based um, spreaders or adjuvants uh, do affect uh, efficacy of our insecticides, so we do not recommend using those. Next slide. This is a not an exhaustive list, but a pretty good list of the labeled crops that we have for Grandivo. Um, some of the major ones, citrus and uh, fruiting veggies and leafy greens as far as and stone fruits and tree nuts. Uh, next slide. OK, so this section of the presentation will uh, be uh, presented by Dr. Melissa O'Neill on all the various efficacy data. Take it away, Melissa. Thank you very much for that introduction, Doug. I like to welcome everyone here and wish you a good day. If you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to enter them into the chat and either Doug or I or other members of our team will get to those as soon as possible. But for now, I'd like to share some of the data on Grandivo with you, starting with the current slide where we look at two spotted spider mite or TSSM control on strawberries. The present research was conducted in Santa Maria, California in 2020 by Apex Ag Research. A little bit of housekeeping on this slide. Many of the slides will see a treatment timing table, and in this case, it's in the upper right hand corner of the slide. You see the four letters and the four dates. The four letters represent four different application timings, A, B, C, and D, and the corresponding dates in this case, all during May, about a week between each one are listed below. 
If you refer down to your X axis, let's take Neal to 13.7 fluid ounces per acre, A through D, for example, that A dash D on that Nialta bar cluster in the middle of the screen refers to those treatments at A, B, C, and D timings in that treatment timing table in the middle right hand side of the screen. So I just wanted to um, keep that in mind for you guys. And also on our X, on our Y axis, excuse me, the mites per 10 leaflets is listed. So that's our metric we're looking at, mites per 10 leaflets with two spotted spider mite. Three different sampling dates for this specific study. The legend at the bottom center of the screen shows sampling dates on May 13th in gray, in blue on June 4th, and then in gold on June 11th of 2020. And in the untreated control, which is the cluster of bars all the way over at the left, we can see that the number of mites per 10 leaflets was about 11 on the first sampling date of May, uh, yes, May 13th. And that was generally the highest throughout the season. And a population decrease was observed on the following two sampling dates in June. However, the range stayed fairly high, ranging between 11 and 6 uh, throughout the course of the season. With the standard material Nialta that I pointed out before, we saw lower pressure compared to the untreated control. The first sampling date, one of the lowest, but then a spike on June 4th and then a decrease again on June 11th. So kind of a population fluctuation with the bell curve with that standard. However, Grandivo at two pounds per acre applied at all four treatment timings, which is the cluster of three bars all the way on the right, showed lower mite pressure throughout the season, being about three mites per 10 leaflets throughout all three sampling dates. So we'll move to our next slide and consider some additional data. Where we're looking at two spotted spider mite again, this time a study on strawberries by Biological Applied Research in North Carolina. And I apologize that we don't have the treatment timing table here, but this study had five or six treatment timings, A, B, C, D, E, F. You'll see that within parentheses down on your X axis. For our metric on the Y axis, marketable fruit harvested, and that's number of marketable fruit harvested. For our first treatment, we had Grand Evo two pounds per acre, and that was applied at 50 gallons per acre on all six treatment timings and had about 110 marketable fruit harvested. The next treatment in the second red bar, working to your right, is Grand Evo at two pounds per acre again, but note that the gallonage here is doubled, 100 gallons per acre. Again, all six treatment timings. With that increasing gallonage, we saw fewer marketable fruit compared to 50 gallons per acre, but still comparatively higher than untreated. Also, Grandivo was applied at two pounds per acre, then at 150 gallons per acre, which is the red bar furthest to the right. All six treatment timings, about the same number of marketable fruit harvested as the 100 gallons per acre treatment that's in the middle, but overall we saw the best results with our 50 gallon per acre treatment with about 110 marketable fruit harvested. Compare that all with the untreated control, which is the brown bar all the way over on the right, and we can see that there were very few marketable fruit harvested there, just about 20. Let's move to our next slide. And then we're going to talk about walnuts for a moment and also a concept called BioUnite. BioUnite is a concept with Marone BioInnovations, which involves combining chemistry along with our biologicals. And what we're looking at with that combination is increased efficacy when we add the two together compared to what we'd see with either one alone. So the present slide conducted in the Chandler variety of walnuts during 2019 in Gridley, California, had only one treatment timing, as you can see with that table there, which was on the 6th of September. For a metric on the Y axis, it's the number of two spotted spider mites per 100 leaves. And there are three different mite stages that are represented here on this graph. If you see the legend at the very bottom below the X axis, the gray, are eggs, the blue are juveniles, and the yellow are adult to spotted spider mites. Standard treatment here was vigilant, applied at 12 fluid ounces per acre, just that one treatment timing. Kind of a bell curve within the population, lowest on the first sampling date. Um, we have eggs in gray here, about two. Juveniles was the highest percentage of the populations, about six, and adults about four with that vigilant treatment. 
And with the BioUnite program, we added the same rate of Vigilant, 12 fluid ounces per acre, to Grandivo, which was applied at two pounds per acre at that same single treatment timing. And although you don't see a gray bar here for eggs, um, there are zero eggs there. So we're comparing it over to Vigilant by itself. We completely knocked out the eggs with this BioUnite treatment. With our juveniles, we did reduce the number of juveniles from six to about four. And with adults, we went down from three to about two. So combining these two products in a BioUnite program with our Grandivo did help to reduce all life stages across this study. Let's move to the next and we'll talk about um, mites on grapes. And I'd like to thank my colleague Marina Serdani, who's in the Pacific Northwest for this data set, which was from Agricultural Development Group in Oltopia, Washington. The variety here was Riesling. Three different treatments in the treatment timing table A, B, and C. They were all during September. Here we have the number of mites per 10 leaves, season total on the y-axis. In the untreated control, that was about 12, that brown bar all the way on the left. The standard program was Invador by itself, 32 fluid ounces per acre, just applied at the A timing, so on the 11th of September, and that brought the number of mites down to about four per 10 leaves. And Grandivo, two pounds per acre, was applied at all three treatment timings and was about half as much as Invador in terms of the number of mites per 10 leaves. What we want to keep in mind here especially is the beneficial mites or other beneficial organisms that are present in many grape vineyards, particularly if you're talking about Pacific Northwest. Many of those predatory mites that we saw data for that were involved with the Vineland research Doug presented a few moments ago may be present. Grandivo won't knock those out. I can't say the same for Invador, but our products are very soft on their profile. And from there, I think we'll move to the next slide and it may be time here for Doug to take over again. Yes, please take over, Doug. Thank you. All right, thank you, Melissa. Uh, so now we're switching gears from Grandivo over to our other insecticide miticide is called Venerate XC. Next slide. So uh, the active ingredient in Venerate is a actually a liquid formulation of uh, also heat killed Burkholderia renangensis as well as spent fermentation media. And the targets, uh, target uh, labeled target pests are mites and sucking chewing insects. And we do have a 2EE for walnut husk fly as well. Uh, labeled rates are for foliar applications, one to four quarts per acre at a seven to 10 day application interval, depending on pest pressure. And again, you're targeting the newly hatched larvae or nymphs, uh, crawlers and adult mites, as well as the sucking insects. Next. As far as mode of action, again, uh, Venerate is a stomach poison. It, it requires ingestion. Um, death does occur uh, in that four to seven day period, although feeding stops Im pretty much immediately. Um, you do get about a seven to 10 day residual. Uh, I failed to mention that about Grandivo as well. We, we're looking at about seven to 10 days residual activity. Um, and uh, Venerate, uh, as mentioned before, is safe to apply uh, in conjunction with beneficials. Next. Uh, similar to Grandivo, again, MRL exempt status for Venerate, uh, standard four hour reentry, zero day PHI, uh, excellent shelf life, very tank mix compatible, uh, easy to use liquid formulation. Um, and uh, next slide, please. This is also a small list of the crops that are on the label for Venerate's use. Uh, all the majors there and even a few minor uh, crops. So you have your grapes and fruiting vegetables, citrus, uh, tree nuts, and strawberries. Next slide. So as Melissa had mentioned before, the concept of BioUnite um, this slide basically is a, an example of 
what we would recommend for the use of Venerate uh, added to a current spray pro program for the control of primarily navel orange worm on almonds or pistachios. Uh, but also uh, knowing that with that spray program, you're also going to pick up uh, mite control and peach twig borer control as well. And the standard uh, mix rate will be one quart of venerate uh, added to, um, in this case, uh, uh, reduced uh, rates of either methoxyphenazide, which, which are your um, intrepid type products, or the AltaCore product, um, again, at uh, a reduced rate. And we do recommend um, getting in that very early May spray uh, when typically you're looking for controlling mites. You can uh, apply Venerate with that program to again go on early uh, to, address, to address any of the um, populations that might be just starting to get started and then apply again at whole split and then two weeks after a second whole split. Uh, next slide. And that's, uh, we're at the data portion now. So Melissa, take it away. Thank you very much, Doug. I think we've been keeping up with the questions in the chat, but if something remains that we haven't gotten to, we will shortly. Thank you for those questions and comments. Doug, I appreciate the introduction to Venerate, and we'll start with the BioUnite program within a study because we've been talking about that subject recently. This particular study was conducted by Field Lab Research in Hickman, California just last season in the Fritz variety of almonds. And there was only one treatment timing, as you can see in that table over on the right hand side of the screen. Treatment A was on the 5th of July. They were out bright and early after the 4th. And here we have two different life stages within the legend at the bottom center of the screen. Eggs are in gray and motile stages, which would include all nymphal stages of mites as well as adults are in the blue. The number of mites per plot on the Y axis. So with our untreated control, we can see that eggs were between 15 and 20 with that gray bar. And with the blue bar, we had near 40 mites per plot motile stages combined. The standard treatment here in the middle cluster of bars was vigilant 4SC and the rate for vigilant was 24 fluid ounces per acre applied on the 5th of July. A good reduction in both eggs which were about 10 and motile stages which were about five with this vigilant standard treatment. With our BioUnite program here we have Venerate XC one quarts per acre and that's added to the vigilant at 4SC, but the rate of vigilant was reduced. It's 14 fluid ounces per acre at that A timing. If you compare that vigilant rate over to what was done with the standalone program, the BioUnite program was 10 fluid ounces per acre less. And if we're looking at what we saw in terms of eggs and motile stages, there was an 81% reduction compared to the untreated control with eggs and a 98% reduction compared to the untreated control with the motile stages. Both of those counts were less than what was observed in Vigilant alone. And so basically we had a very good BioUnite program there, which we'd highly recommend. Let's move to our next slide, please. And we'll talk a bit more about strawberries. Here we had a study in Santa Maria during last season with a numbered variety you can see there. Apex Ag Research conducted it, and this particular study had two treatment timings, A and B, which was May 13th and May 27th, 2021. On the y-axis, we have the total number of mites per 10 leaflets, where in the brown bar, which is the untreated control, we had a very high pressure of about 110 mites per 10 leaflets there, two spotted spider mites, I should clarify. The standard treatment for this study was Nialta, 13.7 fluid ounces per acre, and it was applied at both the A and B timings. You'll notice that gray bar representing Nialta had above 50 total mites per 10 leaflets. Our BioUnite program is in the red bar. 
It consisted of Venerate XC two quarts per acre, which was added to Nialta 13.7 fluid ounces per acre at both timings. And we observed less pressure compared to Nialta by itself in terms of the total number of mites per 10 leaflets. And if you compare that to the untreated control, that's quite a significant reduction in two spotted spider mite pressure. We'll move to our next data set. And we'll consider strawberry for a bit longer with the same study, but we're going to shift our focus here to the total number of predatory mites per 10 leaflets. So we saw data from our pest mites in the prior slide, and there were also predatory mite data collected for this study. I won't go over the study details again because the treatment timings and the contractor as well as the variety and location and year were the same as what we just described a moment ago. But on our y-axis, total predatory mites per 10 leaflets will be the metric we're considering here. With our untreated control, it was between five and six. That's that brown bar. Nialta, the standard, was about the same as the untreated control. However, in Venerate, two quarts per acre added to Nialta 13.7 fluid ounces per acre at both timings at BioUnite program, we observed more predatory mites. Per 10 leaflets. And so this program shows venerates not reducing the number of predatory mites, which is what we expected based on both our long term as well as our short term research that we've conducted over the years looking at the impacts or lack thereof of our products on beneficial insects, including predatory mites. Moving to our next slide we will talk about apples for a moment. Some additional data from Morena Sardani up in the Pacific Northwest, excuse me. Here we have two spotted spider mites on the scarlet red delicious variety of apples. The study being conducted by Qualls Agricultural Laboratory in Ephrata, Washington last season. And this particular study has a rather larger treatment timing table in the upper right. You can see that there were six treatment timings all the way from June to the end of July. Here we have a legend at the bottom center of the slide where there are two different sampling dates throughout the course of the study. The gray is from the 25th of June and the blue is from the 5th of August. And for our metric on the y-axis, the number of two spotted spider mite adults per 20 leaves, and these are both pre-treatment, which is the gray bar, and six days after the final treatment, six DAT is days after treatment, and then F, F being the final treatment on the 30th of July. So we're basically getting a snapshot of what it looked like before we started treating, and then what it looked like at the final treatment. Untreated control had low pressure in the beginning. Um, we can see it around one, but six days after the final treatment, that went up to between four and five, the number of mites per 20 leaves. Looking at the standard as a direct one quart per acre, which was applied at all six treatment timings, we saw about the same number of mites pre-treatment compared to the untreated control, but about half the number of mites at the six days after the final treatment in the 5th of August for the blue bar. Now shifting your eye all the way to the right hand side of the slide, we'll see our Venerate XC bioinsecticide treatment, three quarts per acre, all of the treatment timings listed in the table. The pre-treatment count was actually higher compared to the untreated control and as a direct, that happens sometimes in research studies. But the important portion here is the reduction that was observed on the six days after treatment F assessment, which was on the 5th of August in the blue bar. This represented a 13% reduction, and it was also at a lower cost compared to our standard treatment as a direct. Let's shift gears and look at another slide which I had promised Marion, one of our attendees, thank you for the question. She was asking whether we have any data on ornamentals for mites. And this, <clears throat> excuse me, is a recently breaking data set from Michigan State University in 2021, excuse me, where my colleague Brian Mueller worked with Dr. Smitley to gather data on marigolds. And we have several different bioinsecticides in this particular study. 
all active on mites. Let's do a little bit of housekeeping here. First, we'll see our legend, which is right under the title. It says Smitley, Michigan State University. We can see that there were three different sampling dates throughout the course of the study. The gray, July 6th, the blue, July 13th, and in the gold is July 20th. And also, we'll look at our y-axis, which is the number of motile to spotted spider mite counts. Motile, again, you might remember, is nymphs and adults combined for our pest mites. To start it off, I want to show treatment number one all the way over on the left. This is MBI 306, Z, uh, 20 fluid ounces, I'm sorry, 0 0.20 fluid ounces per gallon. All of these rates are going to be in 0 point something fluid ounces per gallon because this is a small tank mix. MBI 306 is a new product that we're currently developing. It is a unique formulation of Burkholderia renogensis, and we're looking forward to introducing that to the market in the near future. So please look out for that. You can see from these data that the number of mites across the three sampling dates were very low for this product, some encouraging results. The treatment number two, as we work our way to the right-hand side is the untreated control. We can see a natural population progression throughout the course of the season, starting at July 6th and increasing through the 13th and the 20th throughout the gray, blue, and gold bars respectively. The third treatment is Venerate XC. That's 0 0.64 fluid ounces per gallon where we saw a moderate population on July 6th. We knocked them out almost completely on July 13th, and they rebounded somewhat on July 20th, but not to anywhere near as much as what was observed in the untreated control gold bar, which is the next cluster to your left, if you'd like to make that comparison between those two gold bars. Following treatment, number four is Grandivo WDG, 0 0.32 ounces per gallon, and Grandivo really shown in this study. Throughout the course of the season, it had very low numbers of motile to spotted spider mites on all three sampling dates, with the July 20th date having no pressure at all. It's a good option there. The standard treatment is number five. It's the cluster of bars all the way over on the right hand side of your screen and sort of a static population pressure on July 6th and 13th, just kind of hovering there. And on um, that final date, July 20th, we saw that that mite population kind of got out of control and it also reached a little higher than what was observed in the untreated control. I should have mentioned that that flora mite was 0 0.08 fluid ounces per gallon. So overall, we can see that our gamut of MBI bioinsecticides slash miticides gave very good control of two spotted spider mites on marigold here. So I'd like to move on and I believe that's my last data slide. So if there are any questions, please enter them into the chat. I thank you very much for your attention during this data presentation portion. I'm going to enter my contact information in the chat if anyone would like to reach out to me with future questions or inquiries. Thank you very much. Brenda, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa and Doug, for presenting today. Uh, we will now pass it over to Dr. Sandeep Bhattam. Uh, before we get started, I would just like to remind you all for Washington and Oregon, uh, please make sure to uh, type in the chat your name, your accredited state, and your license number. Thank you. Ready? <clears throat> I'm going to share my screen here. Perfect. Thank you. Can you all see my screen? Yes, we can. OK, thank you um, for this opportunity. Um, I'm going to cover a little bit about mites and citrus, and I think I'll we'll just focus more on taking um, Q and A's. Um, I'm a PM advisor for UC Cooperative Extension. I work with citrus. Um, I'm stationed at the Exeter um, Research Station in California. And here's my email and um, office phone number if you need to get in touch with me. Okay, um, mites, uh, mites belong to otter ecari. They have four pairs of legs and um, 
what's you know concerning to us is that they have this modified mouth parts where mandibles are fused to make a straw like structure which you can see in a i'm oh, sorry about that scanning electron micrograph picture over here if i use my um cursor i think i'm going to move the slide so uh this stylet it's actually retractable and what the most of the mites do is um, puncture the epidermal cells and when you know it oozes out sap that they, they drink from it which causes these stippling damage that you can see in uh, in the leaves here down here and when they feed on fruit they can cause um, the fruit to look somewhat pleased because of all the stippling damage uh, stippling it causes they are very small in size um, about 200 microns uh, per adults and uh, immatures are even smaller than that so they're very hard to see you have to go looking for them usually you would need a 10x or 20x hand lens to be able to see them uh, one of the characteristic features for spider mites is that they make webbing as you can see um, in in this photo over here uh, where two fruits are um, touching there is a webbing and there are lots of mites probably hundreds in there they're that small so you have to actually go looking um, for them and conform um, with the hand lens um, just to put things on academic calendar basis um, you know citrus start um, flushing sometime from February, March, and that's when most of the red mites start to appear because they like to feed on the young flush. Um, if you go out to the field now here in California, we're starting to see a lot of red mites. Um, and spider mites too uh, can be an issue, especially um, in January, February, March, when it's, you know, especially in dry, dry years when the trees are stressed and co covered with dust, the perfect environment for spider mites and the other mite species i'm i'm just going to go gloss over the insect species that are mentioned in the slide and go jump to the ray pulpus mites um also come common mites in citrus there are about seven species of ray pulpus mites that have been reported from california and uh, they feed on leaves on fruit um, and they're usually present from April through October. Minor pest, but definitely of a concern because of because they can be a vector to a disease, uh, which we're going to talk about later. Um, most of the mites, because of their modified mouth parts that looks like straw, the damage they cause is stippling damage on leaves, as you can see uh, on the picture over here. And on fruit, um, they cause Again, the stippling dam is a lot of staples look make it the fruit looks like um, it's bleached. That's the that's the damage. But for for them to able to bleach a fruit, there needs to be a lot of mites and a lot of feeding early uh, in the development of um, fruit. So um, the threshold for mites is is pretty high. I think for a citrus red mite, the threshold um, that citrus can tolerate is eight mites per leaf. Um, and for um, spider mites, um, similar. Uh, here is some more information on citrus red mites. They, uh, like I said, they are present in spring. They like the young flush. Um, they cause, they start feeding, and they cause the feeding damage is what causes stippling uh, to the leaves and fruit. And the population, you know, uh, population ex explodes sometime around now through early May. And what's um, the temperatures start rising and the leaves begin hardening, their population declines. They, they're not that big of an issue once we have high temperatures like, you know, above 95 in June and July. And also there is a, a viral disease associated with um, citrus red mite that's, that's usually comes uh, early in June and just, you know, wipes all the red mite population. Uh, and there are predatory mites that are very effective on red mite and effectively control it. Um, on the left side, what I'm sharing with you is uh, courtesy of the research trial, courtesy of Beth Craft and Carwell, who did all these research trials. Um, I think this trial was done, this trial was done in 2018. What you're looking at here is 
Um, up table one is for citrus red mites and table two is for pre ready mites. The effects of the products that are mentioned in this table, Fujimite, Nielta, Magister, Nexeter, and Invidor, do reduce the number of mite populations um, after they were applied on 18th of March. 18th of March is the pretreatment counts and following the four week application, um, Four week after the application, the number of mites uh, per leaf on 4th of April, 11th of April, 18th and 24th. And as you can see, all these registered product effectively brought the populations of red mites down below, um, you know. About one, 1 1.2 uh, for Nielta, definitely much um, lower than. Um, Well, that's interesting. Untreated control even has a uh, lower population than some of the treatments here, probably because um, because of the predatory mite. Uh, second table, what you're looking at is uh, effect of these treatments on predatory mites. And as you can see, some of these products had harsh effect on predatory mites compared to others. Um, Fuzzy mite was relatively more um, safer, had less effect on predatory mites compared to Magister, which wiped out predatory mite population starting second week and they didn't recover until week four. OK. Moving on to the next slide here. Um, next mites that are a minor problem in citrus are berry pulpus mites. They are commonly known as flat mites. They are um, relatively oranges looking in um, color. Um, they are about 200 microns, so you would need uh, a, a to see them um, out in the field. There are about seven species of gray pulpus mites that are present in California. And of them, two of the species, gray pulpus californicus and leucai, are of um, concern to citrus growers because they have, they could, it is still it needs to be proven uh, via research um, transmission studies for um, virus, but they are known to be um, potential vectors of citrus leprosis disease, which is a viral disease of citrus that's currently found in South America and it's making its way northward. So having a vector here um, already present, if the disease makes it to California, then, you know, being vector already present in, in this environment could um, spread the disease and we um, it's really important that we know how to monitor for these mites, how to and the uh, products that are available and how to control these. We um, haven't done any field trials because it has been I've been trying since last three years to find a citrus uh, grower with a uh, red flat mite population in the field, but we we haven't found any um, there have been complaints, but when we go and um, check out, it's usually, you know, they have already treated and the mites are no longer present. Uh, but along those lines, we did um, we did do some lab efficacy trials to see how effective um, the registered mite sites uh, in California were against controlling these brave pulpus mite species. And we found that the products we tested, Agrimic, Nexeter, Magister, Fuzimide, and Canimide, Nielta, control um, prairie pulpus, fully controlled prairie pulpus mite uh, in lab studies. Some of the softer products like Cinerate, which is a cinnamon oil, um, also had a significant effect compared to control. And um, we also tested, you know, a breakthrough, which is a surfactant that is usually mixed with um, insecticide applications as a spreader. That alone um, had control 80% of the mites. So if you are making insecticide application and mixing a spreader, that surfactant that might actually, uh, you know, be effective on um, spray pulpus mites for, um, for this case. Spider mites is a uh, occasional pest in citrus. It's actually an induced pest, which usually flares up after a pesticide application, usually broad spectrum uh, pesticide killing natural enemies, and uh, they do like stressed trees. So uh, in summer when our trees are stressed and 
you know, dealing with drought um, and dust cover, spider mites find that environment really, uh, uh, that environment is conducive for spider mites and populations flare up. Um, and uh, they're easy to identify in the field because compar they are comparatively bigger in size. They have these two spots that you can't miss. Um, and also where they feed, they kind of make this webbing, which um, uh, you can easily see. Um, most of the common, res commonly registered acaricides are effective on um, spider mites. They effectively control spider mites. And predator mites do a great job of controlling uh, spider mites as well. Um, similarly, I, six spotted thrips are effective in controlling spider mites too. Another uh, mite that I want to talk about today is Yuma spider mites. Since 2020, I've been getting um, complaints from our growers that they, especially in lemons, only in lemons actually, that they see this damage that kind of grows with fruit maturity. And at the time of harvest, you have these dents that look like mite damage, and it's associated with Yuma spider mite. Um, and following the following those complaints, we monitor several orchards um, in the valley throughout the year. We two orchards in Dainuba and Visalia um, to kind of see if there were any mite species present. And as you can see from this graph, we did not find new mite spider mite. Uh, we saw some flat mites, citrus red mite, spider mites, but the numbers were very very low. Um, could probably be because the grower was, you know, applying uh, acaricides on calendar basis in both of these orchards because they wanted to um, market their lemons. Probably the reason why we didn't see any, but you may spider white, uh, you may spider mites were not present. Now this is coming back again this year, so we'll be we'll be monitoring some blocks uh, around uh, Ivanhoe area where most of the complaints is uh, coming from to see if um, we can actually find the culprit together with the damage and put two into together and you know uh, figure out if it's actually the damage caused by US spider mite. I wanted to share this um, old um, efficacy trial published in 2004 in Arthur management test where they studied several acaricides to control the US spider mites just to give you uh, give you ops you know um, information on what products are effective on uh, UMI spider mites. They tested Ecarimite, Agrimake, Danitol, Invidor, Fuzimite, Canamite, and all of these products um, effectively control UMI spider mites 21 days after application compared to the untreated. Um, so we have some options to control UMI spider mites. I would recommend to uh, do a pretreatment, you know, do monitoring and sampling and making sure that it's in fact the species that you think it is before making an application because uh, most of the times um, it's going to affect priority mites, which probably would be um, doing the job um, to control other mite species in the field. So you you want to make sure um, that you're monitoring your plots, um, your blocks before uh, making a treatment decision. Um, another thing I wanted to touch base on, uh, which may or may not be um, for this audience, is mites are an export issue, more so in the last decade because of where they like to hide. The Most of the mite species like to go under the calyx and inside navel of the navel oranges. And because they are present there, they could be an export concern in countries that they don't have these species. There are some um, countries like New Zealand and Australia that do not have bripalpus mites, and there are other species of mites like Luria mites and Tarsinimus mites. And also um, important to know that even for exporting the fruit out of the United States, USDA APHIS has a threshold that if um, more than 2% of your fruit is infested with live mites, then APHIS rejects that segment here. So, um, you know, it's important to monitor and make sure that you, your 
you're keeping an eye on your block and you don't have a lot of mites uh, that could in, that could contaminate your fruit um, going out to the export market if that's your uh, market destination. Um, again, um, quarantine pests in many countries where they're not present and we've done a lot of post-harvest research along those lines. Um, it's uh, it's an issue that's become that's it's an issue that keeps becoming worse and worse over years because there is no proper identification tools, especially for identifying um, immatures. If you find an immature, it's hard to tell either if it's a Berrypalpus levisi or a Berrypalpus californicus or some Berrypalpus species that may be present in their countries. And I have, you know, uh, USA APHIS says that the exporting partners are so um, worried, especially about brave bulbous mites, which is a vector for citrus leprosis disease that they are rejecting segments even if they find an egg. And there is no way telling what species uh, it is without doing any some kind of molecular identification, which is also another work in progress um, by some of the researchers down in Riverside. Um, for management, there is no targeted management. And when I say this, I'm talking about targeted management required by uh, these importing partners. So there is no targeted, no regulatory uh, management required, but that could be the direction uh, we may uh, be heading to, especially if these uh, countries intercept more and more mites um, in the shipments that we're sending over to them. Um, so. Like I say in my last bullet point, mites are the next big export issue because of the newer identification tool and increased communication between partners and, you know, uh, becoming worried about uh, citrus leprosis disease coming to their country. Uh, we, over the last several years, we have tested different post-harvest fumigants to, um, for their efficacy against many of the export concerned species. Um, here I have Californicus levisi, Luria formosa, which is another mite species that can be present in citrus, but we have shown through studies that this mite do, does not feed on citrus. So it's uh, it's a low risk, but nonetheless concerning to the importing partners. So uh, just to take home on this slide, there are options um, post harvest fumigants that could be used to control and for it's already being used to control some of the insect species so we have an added benefit there. Just knowing that Brave Pulpus Californics and Levisi are two of these species that actually need high concentration because um, they're well because of their body part they don't they don't actively respire and what that means is that is they're taking up less fumigant in a given time. So um, two hour, one hour fumigation usually don't kill mites as well as it does insects. Um, we also looked at, you know, cold treatment or um, let's say transit temperature treatment because usually used uh, for storage temperature during during the time when fruit is being sipped overseas. So 37 degrees, um, we did a dose response to see how long it takes. And we found that we're killing 99% of the mites in about three weeks of time, which is standard for sipping fruit to Australia, Korea. Um, and then we tested 30,000 mites to confirm this efficacy. And with every trial, we saw that this temperature is very effective and it, it um, um, it alone, you know, the temp cold temperature alone affects um, survivorship of mites. So we're moving on um, in combining the effects, doing a combined effect of fumigation treatment and a cold treatment as a systems approach for controlling some of these export concern pests. Um, just another slide where um, we tested the effects of fumigant phosphine, which is uh, a fumigant that's um, required to control benthrips, another export concern pest for um, Australia and uh, New Zealand, and combining our two-week and three-week cold storage at 
37 degree and looking at how effectively it controls um, pre-purpose mites. It, the results look promising here. So uh, to kind of summarize, mites are minor pests in citrus, um, pests like spider mites and pre-purpose mites are sort of um, induced pests, especially flaring up after protein spectrum insecticide application and also favor stress trees that are covered with dust. Um, another point I wanted to make is many resistant miticides are very effective in controlling mites. And as we heard from Doug and Melissa, there are more, um, more products in, you know, that are showing efficacy. Um, also wanted to kind of hammer the point that mites can be an export issue and there are, there are post-service treatments being evaluated, but be, if we can control the mites before it, you know, even enters the post-harvest scene, then I think that's what we're targeting to with all these uh, infield treatments and applications. That's all I have to say, and I'll take any questions you have. How do I stop sharing? Okay. Yes, yeah, so if yeah, anybody, anybody has any questions, questions, please type them in the chat. Hi, Brenda, and thank you so much, Sandeepa. It looks like we are caught up on questions in the chat, so if anyone has additional questions, please enter them at this time so that we can have them answered while all of our experts are on the line. I'll answer verbally the question of Cindy Bishop. Can you add oil to the venerate treatment? And yes, you can. You can certainly add oil or other surfactants um, to venerate. There are a few considerations which we mentioned earlier. LI700 is one that we don't typically recommend, but oil is most certainly applicable. It can be various different types of oils from refined spray oils to citrus oils or even yucca extracts and things like that have been used in the past. For more additional information, just contact one of our team and we can provide some specific recommendations to your crop and target. Thank you, Cindy. Hi everyone, this is Angela. I just want to mention, I heard some people contact me saying they had trouble accessing the chat. So if there are any attendees on today that for some reason cannot access the chat to post your question, we can have you um, go up to the top of your screen, I believe, and go on the reactions icon. And if you just raise your hand, we should be able to see that and I will unmute you and you can ask your question or of course filter your questions to me via email and I'll make sure they get to the right person. I apologize. I don't know why some people are not able to access the chat. I believe we have more questions. I'm currently working on one on um, surfactants, but I don't know, Dr. Gautam, do you have any information about remote sensing technologies for mapping mite populations? We haven't looked at that here at MBI. Have you had experience in that realm or heard of any researchers that are currently working with that technology? Um, not really. Um, I, and this is my first year working in uh, with field pests and citrus, so I haven't. I have a lot of catching up to do, um, but to date, no, I haven't heard anybody doing remote sensing or you know, um, leaf analysis for mite populations. like to go back and verbalize an answer to a question from Kelly Vance. It was posted some time ago in the chat and it was regarding the use of venerate and magistine having the same AI Burkholderia renogensis. Is there trials and research dedicated to efficacy against root feeling root feeding, excuse me, easy for me to say root feeding aphids with magistine? 
And the answer is basically we do have some data. I was speaking with my colleague Steve Bogash from the University of Maryland Stanton Gill 2020 study where Venerate and Grandiva were explored against root feeding aphids. So um, Kelly, if you'd like to reach out to us with additional contact information, I can send a summary or we can discuss that further, but that study does not include Magistine. However, it does include two of our other bioinsecticide products. Thank you. Looks like we have one more question from Elfer. Uh, are citrus rust mites of any concern in the USA? If so, what is your experience with venerate and mitocytes? The question was about citrus red mites. Yes, are I, citrus. Yes, go ahead. I can answer if they are concerned or not, and I would, I think, pass over to Melissa to explain, you know, uh, answer the rest of the question about venerate. Um, yes, they are uh, a concern, um, especially, like I said, especially if you apply the broad, broad spectrum early in the season and that control predatory mites, then these pest mite populations flare up. And it's uh, always um, a numbers game with pests. If there are more, then they would be causing more damage. And uh, if there are, you know, uh, uh, for citrus red mite, threshold is pretty high. It's eight mites per leaf. If you have eight mites per leaf, then there is a chance that uh, you're going to see um, some bleaching damage on fruit. Bleached fruit have low value compared to the unbleached ones. So it, it is um, it is a concern and growers do apply um, mighty sites to control citrus red mite. Thank you. Dr. Uh -huh. I was going to kind of refer to the venerate portion of that question and thank you for handling the general overview of that. We have some international data with citrus rust mite with Grandivo and Venerate showing efficacy. However, we haven't done any local studies in the United States that I'm aware of. However, uh, Tim Johnson, the head of product development, our PD team, has shared some of those past data with me. So if you need to get into additional detail with that, uh, please reach out to me with the email I provided for Ophir, and we can send you some additional observations with citrus rust mite. Thank you very much for your question. Thank you. And but while we answer more questions, I would just like to remind everyone to, if you have any other questions, you can load um, contact your local rep. We have a map that is up. If you would like to give them a call or an email, I will display that. We, al we also have our PD team if you have any other questions, including Melissa's information. And I was asked for CEU quiz information, so I will go ahead and leave that up. You can go ahead and scan the QR code for the quiz, and I will display a link in the chat as well. So we can continue to answer questions, but for those that have to leave us, I just wanted to mention that.
while we wait to see if there's any more questions, I would just like to thank you both uh, for your time today, for presenting, as well as Doug and everyone that joined us today. If you have any questions, you can remain in the webinar. We will be here for a few minutes. If not, you can contact one of us via email. Thank you. Are we staying? I was not sure if the webinar is done or. It looks like we do not have any more questions. If we have any, we will go ahead and send them. But thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciated it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Gautam, for joining us. It's always a pleasure having an expert with the University of California with us, and we appreciate all you're doing for our growers. I'd like to thank all of our attendees. Again, my email is in the chat if you'd like to reach out to me with any further questions or data inquiries. Thank you for your attention today. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you. Well, yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Doug.